Welcome back to Business 230, Introduction to Business Statistics. In this video, we're going to be covering correlation and linear regression. Now, we did already have a video covering these topics, but they were covering these topics in just a general theory side approach, just what they were, the basis of them, the idea behind what we're doing. Uh, the difference is in this video, we're going to get into the actual nuts and bolts. We're going to get into how we calculate correlation, how we test whether or not that value of correlation we calculated is even significant. Is there actually a relationship between the two variables that we're talking about? We're then going to move into our regression analysis, and we're going to actually talk about not just what regression is doing, but we're going to talk about the assumptions behind the model, and we're going to talk about how we actually determine well, what is the functional form of a model? What is that? How do we calculate those values? And then again, how do we test whether or not those values are significant? So that's the goal for today's lecture. If you haven't watched the one that goes about the theory, the basis of it, I recommend you watch that one first. It's going to give you some insight as to what we're doing. If not, I should be okay to do standalone with just this video. But again, I would highly recommend you watch the other one first. That being said, let's jump into our video for the day, and we'll start off taking a look at uh, the idea of correlation. Okay, so often we are interested about the relationship between two variables. So, for example, in this case here, I have the result, your resulting score on midterm two, and your average quiz score, right? How well you've been doing on your weekly quizzes. What I have is a hypothesis, I have a theory that maybe these two variables are related, so I've thrown them onto a scatter plot, and what I can do is I can visually witness the relationship, and then of course I can go and actually, what we'll see is compute that relationship through our correlation. What correlation really is measuring is, okay, that positive, that negative relationship, it's also measuring is, well, how strong the relationship is, that is, how tightly are each of these data points here, how tightly are each of them going to be kind of placed next to this line that we could draw? In this case here, where they're kind of all over the place, kind of, right, we have quite a few data points that are far away. Well, this would be a case that we'd say, well, it's probably going to be a fairly weak correlation between the two. If alternatively, we can quickly visualize this as if we had a situation where, let's just draw our axes there, we could say we have the same situation for our x, the same situation for our y. If instead we had a scatter plot that looked something like this, well, comparatively speaking, all of these points are going to be much more closer to some notional line that we could draw. Some notional line that we could draw. And we can witness that, hey, given that this data is much more closely packed close to just a single linear line, we would have a stronger relationship, a stronger value for our correlation. So to talk about our correlation, ultimately our correlation our correlation, let's write that down and the terrible chicken scratch, our correlation is going to be ultimately bounded between negative and positive one. Again, this is not telling us the slope of some line. This is not telling us much other than just saying how strong that relationship is. If we're getting a positive number, well, then we're going to get a situation as we've shown in these two scenarios where the data points are moving in the same direction. As x increases, y increases. If x were to go down, y were to go down. They both move in the same direction. What we're going to get is, depending on whether or not this positive value of correlation is closer to 0 or closer to 1, is going to tell us the strength of that relationship. That is the idea as to how closely all of these data points would be to some linear line. In this case here on the left, we would have a correlation much closer to one because we have data points more tightly packed to the line. In this situation here on the right, we would have a correlation much closer to zero because while we can still kind of visualize this positive relationship, it's much weaker. We definitely have a lot more situations that are extremes that don't necessarily fit as nice to this linear line. 
Then we get the case where we get a correlation of zero. If we have a correlation of zero, that is, there's no relationship at all between X and Y. That is, X does its thing and Y doesn't care. Y just does its thing. And it's not going up together with X or it's not going down in opposition to X. It is just entirely on its own. So zero would be the effect where we just have zero relationship between the two variables. Okay, how do we go about actually measuring correlation? Well, just like what we've looked at so far throughout this entire course, let's just scroll down a little bit here. That is, we have our population parameter, mu, the average. Altogether, that was going to be the summation of every single value in our population divided by the population size. That is, for a population on hold, there is one and only one true average. So, for example, talking about heights, if we measured the height of everybody in the world, we would have an average, the one and only average height of the human race. That's ridiculous. We can't really do that. As a result, what we do is we get a sample statistic, x bar. From x bar, really what we're attempting to do is get an insight as to what this might be. And in that case there, we are just taking the summation of our sample, right? All of the values of x that we've sampled, all of the heights that we've pulled in, and we're dividing that by our sample size. Hopefully that's pretty straightforward review for you. But the idea here being is that we have the population parameter, which is what actually exists out there. And then we have our sample statistic, which is a random variable based off of the subset, the limited data available to us. We recognize that every time we get a value of X bar, it'll be a little bit different than this. That is, it's a random variable, but it's gonna be a good insight as to what our value of mu is. Okay, why do I go through all this? Aren't we talking about correlation? Well, the reason I go through all this is because the same is going to be true for correlation. We are going to have a population correlation. That is, in the population on whole, there will be some constant relationship between our two variables of interest. That is, if I took every student and took a look at the results of their average quiz score versus their midterm score, there will be some population correlation between these two variables. For population mean, going back over here, we use the Greek symbol mu. For population correlation, we use, again, Greek symbol. This looks like a little uh, P that's kind of fallen over a little bit. This is the Greek symbol rho. In this case here, we get our population correlation as the covariance, the covariance between X and Y. And it's the covariance of X and Y all over the standard deviation of X and the standard deviation of Y. New term for us, we haven't really seen this before, covariance. How do we calculate the covariance? Ultimately, I'm not going to just give you a bunch of raw data and say, hey, go and calculate this because it's just very time uh, consuming if we were to do that in a pen and paper kind of fashion. But to quickly show you the idea of covariance, we can compute the covariance. I'm just going to move down here to the left. The covariance of X and Y. Well, really, the idea is very similar to when we're calculating the variance of X or the variance of Y. That is, let's just step back and think about that variance first. Say we're calculating the variance of x. So, right, sigma squared is the variance. That was going to be the summation of x minus mu, all squared, all over the entire population, right? Sigma, this is the population variance. So we're using mu, the population mean, and big N, the population size. Okay, that is we're going to do x minus mu times x minus mu. Okay, what's the difference? Well, over here with our variance, instead of going x minus mu squared, what we'll do is we'll go the summation of x minus mu of x, the average value of x, and then instead of squaring it, we'll then do y 
Ooh, that was a bad Y. Let's, uh, let's try to make that a little bit nicer looking. There we go. We have Y minus the average value of all of our Ys. So now instead of squaring it, we're just taking the product of the deviation of X from the mean and the deviation of Y from its mean. From here, because we have paired observations, that is the every X is going to have a corresponding Y value, we just have some N number of observations. Well, N number of paired observations is maybe the better way to put that. And we can get our covariance in that fashion. Okay, that's the idea of covariance. Covariance, uh, really going through that just to feed into where we are getting this value here for row from in order to get our population correlation. Well, just like we have a sample statistic for X bar, we're going to have a sample statistic for our correlation. In this case, we use lowercase r for our sample correlation. And the way we compute this is not really that different. It's just going to be, again, the sample covariance between X and Y. And uh, that's going to be divided by, well, instead of the population standard deviation and the population standard deviation, our sample standard deviation of X and our sample standard deviation of Y. But what about this covariance term, right? We just said, hey, we calculated covariance of X and Y as this X minus mu, Y minus mu, all over population size. Well, if we're calculating our sample covariance, we just make the corresponding adjustments. That is, instead of x minus mu, it would be x minus x bar. Now that got a little bit ugly. Instead of y minus mu, we would do y minus y bar. Instead of n, well, instead of n, we would have all over our sample size minus 1. And again, minus one, because we've lost that degree of freedom in estimating our value of X bar and Y bar. So just that slight correction if we were to calculate our sample covariance. I get into all that nitty gritty, kind of getting into the weeds of it. But like I said, you're not really, I'm not going to give you raw data to calculate this. For our course, for our purposes, what we're really interested in is I'd give you some value of covariance, I'd give you some standard deviations, and then from that covariance, from that standard deviations, you would then have to calculate a value of sample correlation. And then from that sample correlation, be able to determine, is it a strong relationship between X and Y that is really close to positive or negative one, or is it a weak correlation between X and Y that is really close to zero? Okay, so let's suppose that we've gone through that and we have a situation where we have two variables and we go and we compute a sample correlation. So there's our sample correlation of 0 0.56. So, okay, correlational 0.56, it's positively correlated as X goes up, Y also goes up, but it's not super strong, right? One would be that perfect linear relationship between the two but it's not super weak either, right? We're not actually at zero. But what we have to keep in mind is just like when we were going through our distributions with X bar, this is, this is random, right? And we can get different values of this every time we pull out a new sample. So although we have a measurement of our sample statistic of 0 0.56, what we have to ask ourselves is, hey, we pulled this out as a sample, but is it actually large enough that we can take it as evidence that the true value, the true population correlation is not zero? That is, we could go through our five-step hypothesis test and we could go and take a look and say, okay, we've got this value of our sample correlation. Can we take that as evidence that rho is significantly greater than zero, right? Here we get a sample statistic, a sample correlation of 0.56, cool. But is that actually large enough to be evidence that the true population correlation that I'm estimating is actually a positive correlation? Well, if that's the question I wanna ask, if that's my hypothesis test, my null, of course, is gonna be the rest of that distribution. And so I can work that out. There's my null 
there's my alternative. As we go through this, let's go and conduct this test at the 5% significance level. Why the 5%? Well, why not? So there we go. There's our 5% significance level. By far and large, this is just our standard five-step hypothesis testing procedure. Nothing really new so far. I say that, and then we're going to jump into step three. This is where we're going to have that new part. We're going to have our new test statistic. In order to calculate the distribution of rho, we need to standardize it. And as we standardize it, we then figure out the critical values and we get our test statistic. So what test statistic are we using in this case? Well, rho is going to be T distributed. So that is, we are going to be using a T n minus 2. So whatever our sample size is, minus 2 degrees of freedom. And that's going to be equal to, a little bit different, right? It's going to break kind of our mold of how our test statistics have looked so far. This is going to be R, so our sample correlation, all over the square root of our degrees of freedom, n minus 2, divided by the square root of 1 minus R squared. So I'm just saying R there. Again, keep in mind that for R, that is our sample correlation. So that's our test statistic. As we've gone through it, well, we clearly need to know what our sample size is in the situation where we got that value of r. So I don't have the full question here. I'm just kind of uh, ad-libbing this as I go. So let's go and suppose that in this scenario, we are dealing with a sample size of 36. That is, we had 36 paired observations of x and y. And as we went and got the correlation of these 36 paired ops, uh, yeah, 36 paired observations, we calculated that correlation. So that is, if we just want to quickly note that, if this is sample size of 36, we're dealing with how many? We're dealing with 34 degrees of freedom. Great. Okay. What's next? Well, we've done step one. There we go. There's step one. We've done step two. Uh, we just introduced our new test statistic for step three. That's great. That's just something we can write down and refer to later when we get to step five and actually calculate. Step four. Step four is determine our decision rule. So for step four, what we want to take a look at is the distribution of rho. And we get roughly our t distribution. So there we go. Kind of a t. And what are we testing? Well, underneath our null, right? We always look back to our null for our assumption. We say, hey, rho is less than or equal to zero. So our belief is that rho might actually be zero. And we're looking for evidence that, in fact, it's greater than zero. That is, we're looking for a right-tailed test. And we're going to create a rejection region over there in the right-hand side. So hey, even though this is a new variable we haven't seen before, even though this is a new test statistic we haven't seen before, it's just all the same step still. That is, we would have to go from row, can't do anything with row. Sorry, I keep saying row. This is our sample correlation. This is just R. Uh, my apologies. That's uh, pretty sloppy on my side. Row is the population parameter. R, our sample statistic, is what we're dealing with here. So we can't deal with R itself. We have to go and standardize it. And in this case, we're going to standardize it to our T34. What we have to do is go to our table, and we need to look up, hey, what is our T34 critical value? That is the value that's the cutoff between having our 5% in the tail and 45% in the meat, or 95% in the entire rest of the distribution. Going to the table, looking that up, we get a value of 1.691. That is, we could explicitly state our decision rule. We can say, if we calculate a value for this T34 in step five, and if that value we calculate is greater than 1.691, then we take that as evidence against our null. So that is, if that is true, we can reject, we can reject our null. Okay. Steps one through four. Sure, we introduced that new variable. We introduced this new test statistic, but generally speaking, same steps. We get to step five. 
nothing really all too new or exciting here. We're again just doing the same thing we've been doing. That is, we go back to step three, we take that test statistic, we pull it forward, and we just go and calculate the value. What do we need to calculate the value? We need to know what R is, our sample correlation, and we need to know what N is, our sample size. Hey, we have both of those right up there. So that's great. Okay, so what do we get? We have our T34, and that is gonna be equal to R, so that's 0 0.56. And that's gonna be times root of n minus two, so that's gonna be the root of n minus two, that's 36 minus two gives us 34. And then we divide by the square root of, square root of one minus 0 0.56 squared. Okay, what does that give us? We go through that, our numerator works out to about 3.265. And our denominator works out to 1 minus 0.56 squared. Take the square root of that. We get about 0 0.828. Uh, work through that. And we get our test statistic of 3.94. Okay, great. 3.94, that's a great number. But again, it's on its own. It doesn't really tell us anything. We need to take that number. We need to take it back to our step four, and we need to discern, we need to figure out what does that mean? In this case here, well, our T34, our test statistic of 3.94 means that we are falling somewhere over here in our distribution. That is, we are falling clearly into our rejection zone. So that is, we take this test statistic as evidence against the null, and that is, we would reject the null. That is, we would take this to believe that this sample correlation of 0 0.56 is in fact large enough to give evidence that there is in fact a positive relationship between whatever x, y variables we are talking about. So that is, we can say, yeah, these two variables are positively correlated. We have evidence to believe that. Okay, so in this case, we have a question that maybe as you would see in a quiz or a final or something along those lines. In this case, you're interested in testing, hey, is there a relationship between income and happiness? That is, you know, our classic saying, can you buy happiness? So, okay, you've gone and you've collected a sample of 12 individuals. You've computed a covariance of 25 and a standard deviation of hourly incomes of $7 an hour, and a standard deviation of some subjective measurement of happiness of 10. We wanna test at the 5% significance level whether or not there is a correlation between happiness and income. Okay, so we don't have correlation actually given to us in this question, we are not, we can calculate that, right? We've introduced how to calculate correlation earlier on, right near the start of this video, but don't get too excited with that. Don't jump into our calculations yet, right? What we are taking a look at in this scenario is our five-step hypothesis procedure. So don't jump into the numbers, jump into the procedure. And that is what do we wanna do first. Well, first we wanna state our null and alternative. So we have our null, we have our alternative, we have in our question here, whether or not there's a correlation. So we're testing something to do with correlation. So let's write down rho for our parameter. And we're just saying whether or not there is a correlation. That is, we're not saying, is there a positive correlation? Is there a negative correlation? We're just saying, hey, is there a relationship between the two? We don't know what the direction is. So that is, we're just saying, hey, is rho equal to or not equal to zero? Keeping in mind, if we have a correlation of zero, there's no relationship between X and Y. Okay, from there, carrying on step two, well, we say right there in that third paragraph at the start, test at the 5% level. So let's do that. Significance level is 0 0.05. Step three, state or test statistic. Well, what is that? Again, this is a T, TN minus two. So, okay, TN minus two. We have a sample size of 12. So let's just write that in. We have a T10, which is R 
all over our degrees, so not all over, times the square root of our degrees of freedom, so r times root n minus 2, divided by 1 minus r, r squared. Great, that's our test statistic. Step four, step four is determine our decision rule. So, okay, once again, let's just draw the picture. We have our distribution of our sample correlation. It is T distributed, so we get our bell curve centered around what we presume the true population correlation to be. Again, looking to our null, we're presuming that the true correlation is zero. Can't do anything with the R itself. We need to standardize it. In this case, we standardize to the T10. And hey, we're not looking in any one tail in particular. We don't have a belief whether or not this correlation is positive or negative. So we're conducting a two-tailed test. Two-tailed test at the 5% significance level. So that is, we would have 0.025. 0.025, right? We take that 5%, we split it between the two tails in this case. We now need to go to our table. We need to look up, hey, what is the critical value for a T10 for a two-tailed test at the 5% significance level? So let's jump over to our table and have a quick look. So looking that up, we get a critical value of 2.228. And of course, that's mirrored on the other side. So we get negative 2.228. In this case, because it's a two-tailed test, what we're really saying is, hey, if we calculate in step five, a T value that's greater in magnitude than this, well, we take that as evidence against the null. That is, if it's greater in magnitude, it's going to fall into one of these rejection regions. So we state if our T10 that we calculate is greater in magnitude than 2.228, we will take that as evidence to reject the null. Otherwise, otherwise we will fail to reject. Okay, finally we get to step five. Finally, our rubber can hit the road. We can go and calculate our test statistic. But oh no, we don't actually have our correlation. Well, don't worry, right? Going back a few slides, we can recall that our sample correlation is equal to the covariance of x, y all over the standard deviation of x, the standard deviation of y. So that is, as we go and take a look at that, we can we can work that out. We have. 25 as our covariance, so up in the numerator there, 25, and then divided by our standard deviation of each one, well, what do we have? We have standard deviation of seven, we have standard deviation of 10, so what does that work out to? That is 25 over 70. If we work out 25 over 70, we get our sample correlation. That is, we get a sample correlation of 0 0.35. Let's carry around a few extra decimal places here. 714. Ooh, that was kind of fun. Let's uh, try that again. There we go. 714. Okay. So that's our sample statistic. That is our sample correlation. This is what we are testing as to whether or not this provides enough evidence that rho is not equal to zero. So we have that value. Let's go and toss it into the test statistic in step three and see what we get. So for our T10, we're going to get 0 0.35714 times the square root of our degrees of freedom, that's 10, all over 1 minus our sample correlation, 0 0.35714 squared. So that works out for us a numerator of 1.1294. 1 1.1294. 1 oh, let's just carry around the extra digit, 938. And then we're going to divide that by our denominator, which is 0. 
93405. Working through that, we get our test statistic of 1.209. Again, that's a fine number, but what do we do with it? We take this test statistic that we've just calculated and we need to compare it back to our decision rule. So in this case here, we get 1.209. That's gonna fall somewhere over there. That's clearly not in our rejection zone, not over in either rejection zone. That is, we just say, mm, sure, We've calculated a positive correlation of 0.35, but even though our sample correlation is this positive correlation, it's not great enough to take it as evidence that the true population correlation is anything different than zero. That is, we really don't have any evidence to show that there's a relationship between income and happiness. So what we could say is we could say that given that we fail to reject. We fail to reject the null. We say, yeah, you know what? Mm, we don't really have any evidence that there's a relation between income or happiness. Okay, we've gone through two examples. We've taken a look at how to calculate correlation. We've gone through the two examples as to how to test whether or not that sample correlation is evidence as to whether or not the true population correlation is significant. We took a look at one scenario where we have the one-tailed test, just, hey, do we have evidence that rho is greater than zero? And then this one where we just said, hey, is it evidence that there's a relationship at all, whether positive or negative? What we're going to do is we're going to carry on from this. We're going to take this bit from correlation. We're going to talk a little bit about some thoughts with correlation and then move on to the next bit, which is our regression analysis. Our regression analysis is really just building off of correlation to a degree to look at, well, what is the relationship between these two variables? Not just is there a relationship and how strong is it, but regression analysis is an attempt to kind of figure out what the relationship is. So let's jump forward and talk about some of the ins and outs of correlation and then move on to regression. So one of the big things we need to be clear of when we're talking about correlation is that all we are determining whether or not there's a relationship between X and Y. That is, correlation is not causation, right? We don't, we can say, yes, X and Y, they tend to move in the same direction. They tend to have this strong relationship together. But statistically, we cannot go and then say, okay, because they're related to each other, X causes Y, right? X causes Y, that is based off of our assumptions. We have to assume that X is exogenous, X is independent, and then some process happens that transforms X into causing a result in Y. Some of these assumptions are pretty easy to make. Some of them are pretty strong. Some of them are a little bit weaker. Ultimately, causation has to be assumed. All we can really get out of this measurement is whether or not X or Y are related. I bring this up because there's plenty of great examples of what we would call spurious, spurious correlations. And these are situations of variables that are very highly related to each other. That is, they have very high correlations but yet if we stop and think about it, even though they're super closely related, there's no reason at all as to why they should be. It's just entirely happenstance. It's just entirely dumb luck. So for example, let's take a look. We have a situation where we have a sample correlation of 0. Point, oh, this is close, 99789. That's, that's pretty close to one. That's a pretty strong correlation. This is saying whatever this X and Y variable is, they almost fit along that perfect line. When X goes up, Y goes up by almost the same amount. Very, very closely correlated. What are these variables? What is X and Y? Well, these two variables is the amount of money that the U.S. spends on science research. So, hey, how much money are we spending in researching new scientific discoveries? Versus what's our Y variable? Our Y variable is suicide by hanging. So we're saying essentially, 
as the U.S. spends more money on science research, there's a lot more deaths by hanging. Or conversely, because we can't really make any statement about directionality or causation, maybe it says more people hang themselves, the U.S. starts spending more on science research. Both of those statements are clearly false. Both of those statements have an element of causation assumed in them. And clearly, that's not the fact. There's no reason why these two variables should be correlated other than just dumb luck, just the fact that they tend to move in the same direction. Uh, one more example of this, we have another one. This one has a very strong correlation as well of 0 0.9925. What do we have here as a correlation? Well, in this case, we're talking about the divorce rate in Maine. So X would be the rate of divorce in year to year or month to month, perhaps. And in this case here, we are relating this to the rates of margarine consumption. So we find that margarine consumption and divorce rates are very strongly correlated. A lot more margarine consumption, a lot more divorce. We have more divorce, we have more margarine consumption. Again, there's no sense behind that. There's no reason why one should be linked to the other. They're entirely spurious. They're entirely just happenstance or dumb luck. Just because two variables have a strong correlation doesn't necessarily tell us anything. So just a big takeaway. We can't just go and take a look at two variables and say, oh, look, strongly correlated. Clearly, this means something. No, 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 no. Sometimes variables are just correlated with each other. It doesn't actually mean they're related to each other. So just a little bit of background, just a little bit of insight into what's happening there. That being said, let's go jump on. Let's start introducing the next thing we want to talk about, which is regression analysis. Okay, then. So moving from correlation to regression, what we have in this case here is just our paired observations. So again, here's just a listing of those paired observations, and then we've displayed it as a scatter plot. Keeping in mind that in this situation here, we have our X variable, that is our exogenous or our independent variable, that is what one we think is going to cause the thing to happen. And then we have our endogenous or dependent variable, that is the thing that is affected and explained. This explains that. Odometer reading explains price. At least this is our assumption, right? This is, we can only ever assume the causal relationship. We can only ever observe or measure whether or not there is a relationship through correlation. But the direction, the causality needs to be assumed as we just talked about. In this sense, well, it seems to make more sense that the odometer reading explains the price rather than price explaining the odometer reading. So we take a look at this and visually we can just kind of see that generally speaking, there is this negative relationship between price and odometer reading, which again, intuitively kind of makes sense. If our odometer reading is higher, we're going to have a lower price. A vehicle with a low odometer reading, all things equal, is going to have a higher price. So we have this negative correlation between the two. But keeping in mind, all correlation tells us is, hey, what's you know, the relationship? Is it positive? Is it negative? And then how strong of that relationship is it? How tightly packed would all of these scatter points be to some notional line? The linear regression model then, what the linear regression model attempts to do is to formulate an actual line. So keep in mind, formula of a line going back to your middle school days is y equals mx plus b. Sometimes this can be written the other way, the way that we'll often write it, which is b plus mx. Again, potato, potato as to which way you write it. Uh, they both work out to be the same thing. It's just which order you put it in. Uh, what do each of the terms mean? Just as a quick reminder, a quick refresh. B, this is our vertical intercept, the point in which your linear line would cross the vertical axes. M, M is the slope. M is the rate of change. For any one change in X, we get M change in Y. Then, of course, what is X? What is Y? Well, X is our exogenous variable. Typically, that's on the horizontal. Y is our endogenous variable, the variable that's being explained. Typically, that's on the vertical axes. So we have our line here 
what the regression model attempts to do is to actually estimate this line and to be able to draw it, to be able to plop it onto over our scatter plot. And in doing so, we can say uh, in what way, in which way, what is the functional form in which x explains y. And in doing so, we can get something like this. We get that relationship between x and y. Now we'll get into the process of actually how we can calculate this line, uh, where we give you a bunch of intermediate steps. It's not terribly difficult to do so. One of the things that's worthwhile talking about is kind of the basic idea as to how this happens. And that is the basic idea as to how this is done is that in drawing this line, we are trying to find a line that minimizes the square distance of the air. Let's try to do that a little bit better. So we have some vertical distance between a data point and the line. This is our air. This is how far off our estimate is from the actual data. We can draw a few of these in just to kind of visualize this. We pick a line, we pick some line that goes through here such that all of these square distances are as small as possible. These distances, these distances, these are our errors or our residual, the difference between what the model predicts and what the data actually says. So our regression line, that's about third time, fourth time maybe that I've said this, is a line such that we have minimized the squared error between each point and the line itself. From here, just like we had with our correlation, just like we had with that buildup with the mean, population mean, sample mean, population correlation, sample correlation, we're going to have the same kind of idea with this regression line. That is what we could presume is that if we had access to the entire population worth of data, so the entire n, there would be some true data generating process. DGP, data generating process, that is some true relationship that upholds across the entire population between our exogenous variable and our endogenous variable. That is, we could write this true data generating process from the entire population as y equals beta naught plus beta 1 x plus epsilon. Okay, let's talk about what this means. What are each of these terms? What's going on with them? Well, in this case here, beta naught, well, okay, first, first, let's just back up. Let's just be clear. All we've written here, all we've written is just the formula for a line. That is y equals b plus mx. We've used different uh, coefficients, we've used different variables, and we've added this third one as well. So let's talk about it. But just to be clear, that's all that we've done. So B, B naught, well, B naught is just what we had up here as B. That is our vertical intercept. B1, B1, this is just what we had up here as M. This is just our slope. This is the rate of change between X and Y. Epsilon, what's this? Well, epsilon would be across the entire population what the corresponding error is at any x. So we put in some value of x. Let's just go and do that here. Uh, let's pick a bit of a better color. That's kind of hard to see. Well, let's pick some value of x. There we go. There's our value of x. As we put in that value of x into the data generating process, we get that value of y. But what we have to keep in mind is that if this was a scatter plot of the entire population, well, even if this was the scatter plot of the entire population and this was in fact the data generating process, well, here's our estimate of why there's still, there's still some error. In this case, if this was the population, that error would be epsilon. And so the true value of y is going to be our estimate from our line, from our regression line, plus whatever the error is that would exist in that case. That's the population scenario. That is the actual population. If we had 
all the data of every odometer reading and every price out there for vehicles, we could then go and work out what the relationship is between odometer reading and price, such that we could take any odometer reading and estimate what the sale price of that car would be, plus or minus, plus or minus, whatever our built-in error is. Just like with the mean, just like with the correlation, just like with any parameter or statistic we've looked at, we typically, we predominantly don't get to access the entire population. That is, we don't really get to witness what the true data generating process is. What we have to do instead is estimate it. That is, we have to deal with some sample so we go and we collect some sample n that's likely what's been done here since we only have a handful of observations and what we have to do is we have to use this sample to estimate what this true data generating process is and in this case here we get our sample regression line such that y equals b naught plus b1 x plus our error. And keep in mind, right, we're just kind of keeping the same notation. Anytime we're talking about a population parameter, we're using these Greek letters. So we have beta and we have epsilon. When we talk about our sample statistic, well, we're going back to our standard alphabet. So we're using B and E for each of them, respectively. That is just as just as X bar is our sample statistic that is estimating mu. Well, we get a value of B naught that is estimating beta naught. We get a value of B1 that is estimating beta 1. And we get an insight into what the errors might be through the residual of our estimate, the lowercase small e here. So what we're doing is we're estimating this relationship between X and Y, recognizing that just as there's only one true mean, there's only one true data generating process. We have some sample from this sample. We get our estimate, which itself is going to be wrong, is always going to be right. Every time we get a new sample, we'll get a new estimate, but it's going to be kind of our best insight, our unbiased estimate of what is actually happening in the population. That being said, we will get into how we calculate each of these, what we, how we figure out what is B naught, what is B1, that is what is our vertical intercept, what is our slope. We'll get into how to estimate these, how to figure out ultimately how to estimate them and then how to test, hey, is this evidence that this guy is say bigger than zero, less than zero. Uh, for B1, is this evidence that our slope coefficient is different than zero or greater than zero or less than zero. Right? That is, we're going to be able to do hypothesis tests in this case as well, using what we've calculated for B0 or B1 as evidence towards beta 1 or beta naught. Before we get there, though, before we get there, though, we've got to go through a little bit of formality. That is, we're going to introduce the assumptions of our regression model, our ordinary least squares regression model. Um, again, let me just write that down. I've been kind of lazy and just calling it our regression model. There's lots of different forms of regression. This is our ordinary least squares, OLS. I'll say that again. Ordinary least squares. And again, the reason why it's the ordinary least squares is because the way we build it is by getting the least squares of our errors, right? We draw the line such that the square distance of our errors is the least possible. So just to give a little bit of formality for that, we'll run through our assumptions, seven of them all together. Don't get too caught up on these assumptions. When we actually get through calculating this, in this course at least, we're gonna always presume these assumptions hold. But just the same, they're important to know. They're important to have a basis of understanding of so that when you run forward, you move on to the next level course, you move farther on into your academic career, you can actually begin to apply and fix situations if the assumptions don't actually hold. But of course, you have to be aware of what the assumptions are in order to be able to recognize whether or not they're true. 
So let's jump over and take a look. So here we have our seven assumptions all together. I have them all listed out here. What we're going to do is work through each one briefly on its own and talk about it and then move on into actually calculating our OLS, ordinary least squares model. So the first one, the regression model is linear in the coefficients and the error term. What, what does that mean? What exactly does that mean for our coefficients to be linear? Well, again, if we have our regression model, so this is for the population beta naught plus beta one X plus our epsilon. What we're saying is that the coefficients are just as they are. They are just entirely linear, just entirely on their own. What we can do is we can do non-linear transformations of X. That's perfectly fine. That is, we could say that the relationship between X and Y is beta naught plus beta one, and then every value of X is actually a squared value of X. That's, that's perfectly fine. That's a legitimate transformation we can make. We can transform X such that this transformed value is what relates to Y. We can do that. We can do that, and we can do different types of uh, transformations. We can do that x cubed, x to the fourth. We could do the square root of x. We could take the natural logarithm of x. As long as it's just to our exogenous variable or even our endogenous variable, that is fine. What we cannot do, and let me use red to say no, we couldn't go y equals beta naught plus, uh, let's go something like, beta one squared x plus epsilon, right? That is our coefficients couldn't be non-linear. Alternatively, we couldn't go like this, uh, equals beta naught plus beta one x plus, now let's suppose that our error terms are actually a logarithmic function. Again, that would be non-linear in the error term, that would be not allowed. So again, not getting too caught up on this, but what we need to presume for our ordinary least squares model to work is that our coefficients, beta naught, beta one, and our error term are linear in that data generating process. Keep in mind, we don't get to actually see what the population is, we just have to estimate it. So this is of course the assumption we have to make. We have to take a look at the data and say, hey, is this a valid assumption that we feel we can make? Again, don't get too worried about that, just running through this so that you're aware of these assumptions. Next one we have to take a look at is number two, that the error term of the population, so that is epsilon, epsilon has to have a mean of zero. So that is if we were to work through and we were to calculate the mean, of epsilon, that is, we were to take the summation of all of these error terms all over all the error terms that exist, they have to equal zero. Similarly, the way that that should work out for us, the way that that should work out for us is that if we were to calculate the mean of all of our error terms, that is little lowercase e, so if we were to take the summation of e all over n, that should be, again, because this is just a sample statistic, there's going to be error, that should be approximately zero. Or if we did a significance test, right, if we actually went through our five-step hypothesis test, we should be able to test and say that, hey, even if our value of E is X bar E is different than zero, that it's not significantly different than zero. That is, we wouldn't be able to reject that null. Okay. That's the basic idea of this. The great thing with this assumption is that if we have a regression equation with an intercept, so here we can just do the sample one, B1, X plus E. If we have an intercept available, if we have the intercept put into our regression equation, it will always force this to be true. By having this, the mean of this is forced to be zero. So good kind of rule of thumb, we're going to include an intercept when we run the model. There may be cases where you assume that the vertical intercept is zero, so you just don't include it, you force it to be zero in the model. That's fine, but we just have to be careful because if you force this to be zero, 
well, then you no longer force this to be true. So you need to be careful with that in this case. Again, this is just more to make you aware of these situations so that if you were to go forward with practice in this, you at least have a basic level of awareness of these assumptions. Going on to number three. Number three is all independent variables are uncorrelated with the air term. Uh, okay, what's an independent variable? Well, let's just write out our situation here. Again, we'll use the sample regression line. So B naught, B one X plus E. What we mean by an independent variable is our exogenous variables are X. That is, if we were to calculate the correlation between X and the air term, this should be approximately zero, or at least not statistically significant, not statistically different than zero. And really what we're getting at here is that we shouldn't have any relationship between what is happening here and what is kicking around in the unexplained aspects, right? Because, hey, X and Y are going to be related. So if X and E are related, well, then likely there is something that exists that also explains this that we're not incorporating. And that's what's showing up in the errors. So if ever we have a case where this correlation is not zero, what this likely means is that there's something else that is also explaining why, something else that we've omitted or not included. And because of that, we're losing a lot of our predictive capability. And if we're losing that predictive capability, we're not gonna have a great model. So for example, if we go back to that one we looked at where Y is sale price and X is our odometer reading, uh, we can say X1 is our odometer reading, we could presume there are actually probably other independent variables that also explain this sale price. For example, we could have another independent variable, which is your make or model. Different vehicles will sell for different prices. For example, Toyotas might be considered to be worth more than, say, a GMC, or a Mercedes might be worth more than a Ford, right? So depending on what the make and model is, this could also influence the sale price. Maybe we have another situation here where we have a third one, which is, I don't know, let's suppose color. Maybe people have a preference for one color of car over another color of car. So all of these different values of X, all these different independent variables could all explain Y. And if we don't include these guys, if we don't add them explicitly to the regression, well, then they just show up in the air term. And if they just show up in the air term, we're losing predictive ability. So how would we do that? Well, ultimately, instead of just having what we have here, which is what we're going to focus on, which is a simple linear regression or simple or ordinary least squares linear regression, we could have a multiple regression, which is we could go B naught plus B1 X1, and then we'd include these other guys, B2 X2 plus B3 X3 and then plus our air term. And then by doing so, we've actually been able to increase our predictive capability. We've been able to increase our ability to estimate our sale price because we've brought in more information that before was just captured as an error, an unknown. So if ever we have correlation between our X value and our error term, likely we have omitted variable bias and we'd want to include those omitted variables in our model. Carrying on, when we take a look at our air term, we need to make the assumption and we need to witness that our air terms are unrelated to each other, that the air terms are not correlated to themselves. So that is if we take a look at the observation order versus the value of the air, we shouldn't see any pattern. If we see a pattern taking place, like what we see in this left-hand scatter diagram, where we are having kind of this U-shape, this would be problematic. We wouldn't want to see this. That is, there's information in the air that is able to predict the next air, right? Such that, hey, as we move along, our airs are decreasing to a point and then increasing. 
That is, there's predictive power in here. We would call that serial correlation. This is problematic. Having serial correlation reduces the precision of our estimates. It makes our model a lot less precise. It gets rid of a lot of our predictive power. If we have this, we have some problems. We need to go through correcting them. We're not going to get through how we correct it in this course. It's just one of those things we need to take a look at and go, hmm, if this is taking place, we have a problem. What we would preferably like to see is something more like this right-hand diagram, which is when we take a look at the errors versus their observation order, we just have complete randomness. There's no real correlation taking place here. We don't see any pattern occurring. In this case, our errors are truly just random zero correlation. This is what we want to see. In this case, we can have a pretty high functioning estimate and good predictive power with precise coefficients. So this is what we want to see, randomness in our errors. Step five, well, I'm not sorry, not step five. <laughs> we have assumption five. Assumption five is to go along with whether or not our variances are constant. Again, as we look over the observation order, so moving along air one through to air n, what we should witness is constant var variability as we move through. Again, in the left case, we don't see that. We see a period of time where we have low variability, not too much variability happening there with the airs. We then jump to high variability, back down to low, back up to high. Even without that repeating side of it, even if we just stopped our data right here, if we had this low variability followed by high volatility, this would be problematic. We would say that this error term is heteroscedastic. That is, it has different variances, different volatility based off of where we are in the data. This is problematic doing this really, really causes a lot of problems for our estimate. It introduces bias into our errors. It makes our errors much, much larger, reducing the precision of our estimates. What we would want to see as we take a look at our errors is, again, the right-hand term such that, hey, doesn't really matter where we draw. We get pretty much the same level of volatility, same level of variability throughout the entire bit of our error term. That is, in this right-hand case, we'd say that our errors are homoscedastic. Being homoscedastic, that is same scatter throughout the entire stretch. This is what we want. If we have homoscedasticity, homoscedasticity, in this case, then we have very strong, high precision in our estimates of our coefficients, and we get better prediction, better understanding of what's happening as a result. Six, what we would have is that no independent variable is the perfect linear function of other explanatory variables. Now, okay, if we have what we're going to be dealing with here in this course are simple ordinary least squares, that is our simple ordinary least squares is just this case here, y equals b0 plus b1x plus our error term. If this is the case, we don't have to worry about six. We're not going to have multicollinearity taking place. Multicollinearity is only a uh, problem if we have multiple ordinary least squares. That is, if we were to run this situation where we have b1 x1 plus b2 x2 plus e. If we were to run our regression model in this way, we potentially could run into the problem of having multicollinearity. And this occurs whenever these two variables, x1 and x2, are just a linear function of each other. An example of this might be if x1 is a dominator reading in kilometers and x2 is a dominator reading in miles. Well, the conversion of kilometers to miles is just a linear transformation. And really, it's just giving the same information. So if we were to put both of those variables into this explanatory regression, we would have multicollinearity taking place. In this case, we'd probably have perfect multicollinearity taking place. And it's going to greatly reduce the precision of our OLS estimate, greatly reduce the precision 
of B1 and B2. We'd have a lot of variability in this estimate and thus we'd have a lot of trouble actually knowing whether or not it's significant. So problematic, problematic. Again, in our case, we're not gonna to have to worry about that too much because we're gonna be dealing with just simple least squares, a situation where we just predominantly have one regression coefficient. Finally, our last assumption of our OLS model, our last one is that the error term is normally distributed. That is, if you were to take a look at the errors, they're gonna be normally distributed all the way through, centered around zero. So. Right, if we were to take a look at all of the errors, here we go, there's our errors. They're gonna be like this. Earlier, we said in number two, the error term has a population mean of zero. So we'd expect it to be zero. We expect most of our errors to be pretty close to zero with only a few being really far away. And again, it's because our whole OLS model is minimizing the sum of squared errors. Not having normally distributed errors doesn't change our ability to estimate our coefficients, B0 or B1, but what it does impact is our ability to perform hypothesis tests around B0, B1. That is, if our errors are not normally distributed, we can't go and lean on this normal distribution in order to test whether or not B1 is different than beta 1 or sorry, whether or not B1 is evidence that beta one is say different than zero. Same could be said for B0. So we need to have this assumption that our error term is normally distributed in order to perform our hypothesis tests later on. Okay, so we've introduced the idea of correlation. We've introduced the idea of our linear regression model and we've run through our seven assumptions. Those seven assumptions, like I said, just keep them in your back pocket, keep them as an awareness that these need to be met. As we go through our situations here, we're going to wave our hands. We're gonna assume that all those assumptions are always satisfied. What we're gonna introduce here going forward is we're gonna introduce how do we actually compute our regression function. How do we actually compute what is that OLS model? So in this case here, we have a fairly simple situation. We have what a sample size of four paired observations, four values for consumption, four values for income. We've presented them as a table and we've again shown the scatter plot. One of the first things that we need to do when we do this is we need to make the assumption about, hey, which variable is the dependent variable? which variable is the independent variable? That is to put another way, which one is endogenous, which one is explained, and which one is exogenous, which one is doing the explaining? Well, taking a look at this, we have income and consumption. My presumption, the way that I would assume, is that your level of income explains how much consumption you end up partaking in. I would presume the higher your income, the higher your level of consumption. And taking a look at this, we see in the scatter plot that we have this positive correlation between the two variables. I've already graphed it income on the horizontal, consumption on the vertical. That is to say that I believe income explains consumption. Keep in mind, this is again an assumption. We have to make this assumption of causality, of directionality, in order to be able to work through this. A lot of our model will ultimately hinge on the validity of that assumption. So, okay, we've made that assumption. Income explains consumption. So, let's write down our model. We will say that Y is consumption, I'm just going to abbreviate that to C-O-N-S for consumption, X, X is income. I'm just going to abbreviate that as I-M-C for income. So, okay, given that, we would have our model, which is Y equals some vertical intercept plus B1, our slope, times X, our level of income. Great. We know what X is. We know what Y is. That's just our data. What we now need to do is we need to estimate, well, what is our slope? What is this vertical intercept? And again, keeping in mind that we're estimating this in such a way to minimize these squared errors between our line and each of our data points. Okay, how do we go about it? 
Well, we can estimate B0 and B1, and we can go through all the bits with it. Really, I'm going to say, look, here's the equation. This is how we can calculate it. Kind of jump a few steps. Uh, the way we start off is we start off by calculating our slope. So B1, B1 can be calculated as our correlation. Oh, this is why we started off with correlation. We need to know what this was. Our correlation times the ratio of our standard deviation of y all over our standard deviation of x. So the ratio of our two standard deviations. And again, sample coefficient, sample slope, estimating the true population slope being computed by our sample correlation, our sample standard deviation, and our sample standard deviation. So all of this is sample, trying to estimate what is the true population situation. We could write this another way, right? There's algebraic equivalence here. We could also say that B1 is equal to the covariance of X and Y divided by the variance of x. So that is, we don't need to have the standard deviation of y at all. Covariance of x and y all over the variance of x. And really this just comes through how we calculate our correlation and the way that algebraically those two work out. I'm not gonna spend the time to go through the algebraic manipulation from one to another. If you're interested, it's not that hard of an algebraic step to make. Feel free to look into it, but for now you can just take it as those two are equated. So, hey, that's actually not too bad. Uh, we could go through and compute the values of B1 just from our raw data here. That is, I've shown you how to calculate covariance. Uh, we know how to calculate variance. We could calculate these terms and get our value of B1. Similarly, you know how to calculate correlation from covariance. And we know how to calculate our standard deviation. So again, we could calculate B1 just from the raw data. But as I said, I'm gonna be kind. That is a lot of intermediate steps. That's a lot of time, a lot of room just to make error in the meantime. So what I'm gonna typically do is I'll give you these values. That is in this scenario here, as we take a look at consumption and income, we have a correlation of 0.89. We have a standard deviation of y. Standard deviation of y is equal to 6.58. And the standard deviation of x. Standard deviation of x is 13.33. Perfect. Now that we have that, A, that saves us a whole bunch of steps, but we can, more importantly, we can solve for our estimate of our slope, our estimate for B1. So what does that work out to? Well, hey, we have our correlation and we have each of our standard deviations. So we might as well use this expression here. So we get 0 0.89 times the ratio of our standard deviation. So y over x, we get 6.58 all over 13.33. Work that through, what do we get? Uh, work out that ratio times by 0 0.89. We get a value for our slope coefficient of 0. Point, I keep that to two digits, why not? 0 0.44. So great, we've estimated our first slope coefficient, our first part of this regression function. Yeah, that wasn't actually too bad. That wasn't too hard. But we still have one more to do. That is, we've gotten that guy down, we still don't know what our vertical intercept is. So let's go through and work that out. To work this out, well, let's, let's start off with a little bit of a pause. Let's start off with a little bit of a pause because I've seen this error being made before, right? Is that we go through and we say, okay, hey, we now have y equals b naught plus 0. 4, 4, that's just our value we calculated for B1, X. And I've seen people go, oh, hey, hey, cool, look at this. I have these values of X and Y. I could put in one of these values of X, that is, hey, I could say X is 84, 
right? That's just the first row here. And I know when X is 84, consumption is 64.8. And hey, I now know everything but one part of my equation. I could go through the algebra and I could solve for B naught. Okay, in theory, that's a great idea, but it falls apart. And the reason it falls apart is we have to recall that this line does not necessarily pass through all of our data, right? This equation is actually y equals b naught plus b1x plus an error term in order to account for each of the data points that it goes off. That is, this line very well, yeah, sure, it might, it will have a value of x of 84, but it'll probably get some estimated, some predicted value of y that will likely not be this true value of y. So we can't just go and jump to that conclusion. We can't just take some of our data and throw it in in order to get our value for our slope intercept. So what do we do? How do we calculate B naught? Fortunately, fortunately, one of the features of our OLS regression is that while this line may not pass through each or any of our individual data points, the OLS regression will always pass through the value of X bar and Y bar. That is the way that the OLS regression works and we don't need to go through the proof or any of it like that. We can just kind of wave our hands and take it as fact. This ordinary least squares regression line will always pass through the average value of X and the average value of Y. Those will always be a point on the line. So being that they're going to be a point on the line, we could go and say, okay, hey, y bar equals b naught plus our slope coefficient that we just calculated times x bar. And now we could do what maybe we were thinking of doing up here, which would have been wrong, but we can do that here because now it's going to be okay because y bar and x bar will always fall on our regression line. But of course, what this means is that we need to figure out what is the value of y bar and what is the value of x bar. To be honest, this is a situation where the calculation is quite simple. Sometimes I'll give you this value, sometimes I won't. Um, for a sample size of four, hopefully you can calculate a value of x bar and y bar pretty rapidly. In this scenario though, just for simplicity, I will give it to you. That is, we're going to have a value of X bar. Our average income will be 69.25. And our value for Y bar, the average Y bar, sorry, the average uh, consumption is 58.48. So that is, we're sure that our regression line falls through these points. So making that substitution, we have 58.48 equals b naught plus our slope coefficient that we calculated of 0 0.44 and our x bar our average income of 69.25 again just to reiterate the way that this works is that for any other value that we would have had here for x and y it would have been x equals y if we included an error term 84 through this functional form plus some error could give us that 6480. In this case, because y bar and x bar actually fall on the line itself, that error term, that error term would be zero. There'd be no error on this. Both of these values are on the line itself. So through here, we can go through some algebraic voodoo. We can go through and rearrange, get b naught by itself. Right, the way we can do that is, first of all, work out, well, what is 0 0.44 times 69.25? So to do that, we get 0.44 times 69.25. We get, let's just rewrite this whole thing, 58.48 equals B naught plus, uh, sorry, I'm just rewriting the thing above instead of writing what the answer is, B naught plus, 3047. Now again, continuing to get B naught by itself. So subtract 3047 from each side. So we get 5848 minus 3047. We get 
2801 as our value for B naught. Okay, then going through all that, what we've just done is we've worked out our regression, our ordinary least squares for this data set, such that we have our functional form of the relationship now as our linear intercept 2801 plus our slope coefficient of 0.44x. That is our level of consumption is explained by this functional transformation of our income. So we take any value of income, we put it into X, it's gonna get transformed and it's gonna give us a predicted value of Y, an estimate as to what our, an estimate as to what our consumption would be. Keep in mind, it's likely not gonna give us our true value of consumption because it's gonna have some error built into it. So anytime we are predicting consumption, we would say that that predicted value is y hat, the predicted value. So for example, uh, let's take one of our rows out of, uh, out of our data table here. Let's go pick the second row just to pick something different. That is, we're gonna say, hey, when we have an income of 53, what is our predicted consumption? We know that we have an observed consumption of 53.1, but of course there's gonna be some error built into that. So what is it? Let's work that out. We have our intercept 28.01 plus our slope coefficient of 0.44, and then we'll put in our income that we're interested in, 53. So what do we get? We get 2801 plus 0.44 times 53, and we get a predicted value of consumption, that is our y hat, is 51.33. That is what our model would predict your level of consumption were to be should you have an income level of 53. Now, taking a look at that, of course that's wrong, right? We say, well, hey, hey, look, we have our data point here of 53.1. That's what consumption actually was when we had income of 53. Yeah, right, we are estimating, we're running our model, right, truthfully to get our value of y, not y hat, our value of y, we would have 28.01 plus 0.44, our value of x, 53, plus some error term. Well, hey, in this case here, if this is our actual value of y right here and not y hat, well, we know what the actual value of y is. We know the actual value of y is 53.1, right? We got that from right there where it explicitly says it. So, hey, in this case, we could work out what all of that is and algebraically solve for what our error is for this observation, what that level of uncertainty is. Well, okay, that seems pretty messy about ways to go about doing it. Ultimately, we can calculate that. We can calculate the error term as just simply the difference between, error term is just the difference between our actual observed value of y and our estimated value of y, y hat. So working out that difference and we get our error term. Okay, let's uh, take a look at another quick example here. This is, again, an example that might be reminiscent of what you'd see on either a quiz or a final. That is, we'd have just the following information. So in this case here, we have information on price and quantity of shoes, such that we have a correlation between price and quantity of negative 0.9793. So pretty, pretty uh, strong correlation between these two. Negatively correlated, we can uh, A, see that in the correlation value, but also we see that in our scatter plot as well, that these are quite tightly packed along a linear path and downward, uh, downward trajectory. Uh, from this, the following sample statistics have been calculated. So yes, we have the raw data, but as I am kind, I've given you all the values that we need. That is, we have the average value of X bar, Y bar, and the standard deviation of each one. 
Uh, first question is we want to estimate the equation for the line of best fit using OLS, using ordinary least squares regression. And we want to compute the values for B0 and B1. In this case, I've given us right here the formula for each one just to help us remember what those are. Uh, wouldn't necessarily do that on the quiz or the test, but as we're right here, rather than us flipping back to our notes to try to pull them up, we're just going to provide it at this time. Once we have that equation estimated, we then want to estimate what must be the price when people are buying 120 shoes. So we'd say, okay, hey, quantity is 120. We're going to determine what the price is. And then finally, we're going to go and compute the error in the estimate when Q is 133. So if Q 133, I'm presuming that's one of our Qs in this table here. Yeah, here we go. We've got a Q of 133 yielding an actual price of 244. We know our regression estimate will yield a Y hat, an estimate that will be different than the actual point. And that difference, of course, is the error in our estimate. So first step, although this has been alluded to and although this has been kind of given to us in the graph, the first step is to identify what is our dependent, what is our independent variable. That is, which one is our X, which one is our Y. In this case, what we are presuming is that quantity determines price. So what we're going to do is we are going to set this up as y equals b0 plus b1 x, such that y is the price and x is the quantity. Although this might seem a little bit counterintuitive, truthfully, this is just an economics example and we're doing the basic P and Q. And based off of that, we are trying to estimate what our demand curve is. That's really what we're doing if we're trying to put some context to this, uh, to this scenario. So, okay, first question then, what is the estimation of our line of best fit? So we wanna figure out what is our value of B naught? What is our value of B1? Okay, we've just gone through how to do that. The way we do that is we figured out what B1 is first. So let's figure out what B1 is. Uh, again, our formula, B1 is our sample correlation multiplied by the standard deviation of Y over the standard deviation of X. All of these things can be just pulled out of the information in the question, so we can pull them out and calculate. Our correlation is negative 0 0.9793. And we get a standard deviation of Y of 5541. We get a standard deviation of X of 2352. Again, just the reminder, where are these numbers coming from? Here's our standard deviations. Here is our correlation value. So just pulling them from there. Working through that then, what do we get? We get the ratio of our standard deviations, 55.41 divided by 2352, multiplied by our correlation statistic. We get a value of B1, our slope coefficient of negative, we'll carry a few decimal places, 2.3071. Okay, so a few decimal places kicking around there. 2.3071. Now we need to, well, we have beta one, sorry, not beta one, we're not dealing with the population data generating process, we're dealing with the statistics. So we're dealing with B1, our slope coefficient. Uh, from that, once we have that, we need to work out B naught. And what we got for B naught is, well, here, we've already done all that algebraic voodoo for us. We've rearranged the equation to say, hey, you can just calculate B naught as Y bar minus B1 times X bar. So, hey, we have our values of X bar and Y bar given to us up top here. So let's just go and put that in as such. So we have Y bar of 174.40. And then we're going to minus our B1. B1 is negative 2.3071. And then times our value of X bar. X bar is 162.60.
Okay. Uh, keep in mind, minus negative, well, you do minus negative, and we could re really rewrite that as, there we go, plus. So we get our vertical intercept. We get a vertical intercept of, let's work through that, that's 549, and we'll carry around a few decimal places. We'll say 534. Okay. So we've estimated our slope coefficient. We've estimated our vertical intercept. We can bring those two together to then get our estimation for our line. And we get that our predicted value of y, y hat, is going to equal 549, five, uh, not 43, sorry, let's fix that, 534. 534 minus our slope intercept of 2.3071, just our slope coefficient, and then our value of x. So we have our linear expression. We have our formula for the line of best fit. From here, we can then move on to the next question. Our next question is, where is it here? Estimate what must be the price when people are buying 120 shoes. So when X is 120, what is our estimate of Y bar? Well, hey, we can do that. Sorry, I said Y bar, I meant Y hat. Y hat equals 549, 534 minus 2.3071 times 120, just putting 120 in for our value of x, and then calculating, uh, let's work through that, we get y hat equal to, when x is 120 times negative 2.307, and then 549, 531, we get a y hat of 272, uh, let's carry a few extra decimal places around there, 682. So that is, when there is 120 shoes being bought, we estimate that the price is $272. Sounds like some pretty pricey shoes in this scenario here. Okay, so that's just a way that we can estimate some value of y hat given some value of x. The next question, the final question we wanna work through in this case here is, well, okay, what if we're actually doing a value of x that we know? So that is, we have up here in our, where is it? Right here. Q of 133 should yield a price of 244. So, hey, if that's the case, Y should be 244, but we're going to get our estimate of Y hat from this. So let's work it out. And let's figure out what our error is at that point. So again, we're going to have our estimate, Y hat which is gonna be our vertical intercept, 549, 534, minus our slope coefficient, 2.3071, times x, in this case, we wanna use an x of 133. Okay, we go through, we work that out, what do we get? We get a value of y hat of $242 and 69 cents. Okay, what was our actual value of y? Our actual value of y, let's just scroll up and take a look there. When q was 133, we said y p price was 244. How does that compare? There we go, 244. That's not too bad, that's pretty low air. We can calculate the size of that error though. Again, keep in mind that the error is just gonna be our actual value of y minus our estimated value of y, y minus y hat. So we get ah, 244 minus 242.69. That's gonna give us an error of, again, a few decimal places, 1.3103. So hey, at this point here, our estimate was only about $1.30 off of the true value of y. I mean, honestly, given our level of correlation here, our line is a yeah, pretty good fit. We wouldn't have really expected that large of error just visually looking at the scatter plot. 
That actually leads us nicely into our next topic, which is the goodness of fit. That is, we've gone, we've taken a look at our data, we've estimated our regression model. Where is it here? Y hat is 549, 534 minus our slope coefficient 2.3071 times x. As we've done that, we would have, I'm just gonna entirely butcher this here, but we would have had some notional line of best fit representing that regression equation. From here though, the natural question is, well, hey, how good of a model is this? Is it actually is it actually fairly representative of the data? Or is given the way that the data is, this is our best we could do, but still a pretty weak model, still does not really fit the data very well. Turns out what we have is we have a way that we can kind of determine how well our model fits the data and give us a good kind of uh, starting point at least to understand how much we should or could rely on this model. And that is our whole idea as we get to looking at how we would measure our goodness of fit. So, so far we've computed correlation for the variables. We've tested to see if these are significant. We've built our linear regression models. We've evaluated this relationship between the variables. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go and say, hey, here's all the data. How good is this model at explaining it? And the way that we're gonna do this is with a, another variable. This other variable is what we call R squared. R squared, this is also known as the coefficient of determination. Let's write that down. It's important enough. It comes up enough that we want to be able to recall it. Coefficient of determination. A bit of chicken scratch there, but coefficient of determination. Really, R squared provides us that initial insight as to how well our model fits the data. Uh, R squared is going to be bounded between zero and one. In this case here, an R squared value of zero or close to zero signifies an extremely poor fitting model. That is really the model does not explain much of the data at all. If we have an R squared of one, this would be an extremely well fitted model. That is our model explains a lot of the variation in the data. How do we interpret it? Well, really it is just this bounding of zero to one is kind of a percentage of variation. So that is, we can think of R squared in the following way. Let's suppose we calculate, and again, just notionally without talking about really where this number comes from yet, let's just suppose we calculate a value of R squared of 0 0.678. So, okay, it's kind of between zero and one, it's closer to the one than the zero, but what does it really mean? What it means is that the variation in our x's, so the way that x is jumping and bouncing around here, it explains, it explains about 67.8% of the variation in y. So x is jumping around, it's doing its thing up and down. This variation in x explains, yeah, just over two thirds, 67.8% of that jumping around and that variation in y. So that is the bigger our r squared is, the more the variation in x explains the variation in y. The smaller this value of r squared, I guess that value of r squared, the smaller that value of r squared, well, we might have a whole bunch of variation in x, but it's only explaining a tiny little bit of the variation in y. So ideally, larger value of r squared is much better, x is much better at explaining why y is moving around and changing. Okay, that's the idea of r squared. That's the idea of our measurement of goodness of fit. How do we go about measuring it? Well, to go about measuring it, we need to introduce a few terms. What do we have? What's the best way to do this? Let's just go through and throw out the formula and then we'll talk about it. So R squared is gonna be equal to S S R, that is the sum of squared regressors all over S S T, sum of square 
total, uh, we could also write this a different way. And that is we could write it as one minus the SSE, that is the sum of squared errors all over SST, the sum of squared total. Okay, and that's where my moment of hesitation was here as to how best to do this. What are these terms? What exactly do they mean? So let's go define them and then we'll come back to the equation. Let's just go down a little bit to do that. So starting off with SSR. Again, what is SSR? This is our sum of squared regressors. What exactly is our sum of squared regressors? It is really the sum of squares that can be explained. So that is going to be, mathematically speaking, the summation, sum, of our estimated value of y hat minus y bar and then squared. So the regressors, meaning it's coming from our regression. So hey, there's y hat, our predicted value from our regression. We then have y bar, again, that's from the regression line. So it's saying, hey, how far is each estimated value of y hat deviating from the average value of y? And that gives us our sum of squared regressors. Uh, confusingly, confusingly, you may sometimes see this guy being expressed as the sum of square explained. Sum of square explained. I say that this is very confusing because we also have an SSE up here, and that SSE we said was sum of squared errors. Uh, rather confusing, right? Rather confusing. So because of that, we're just going to keep our terminology simple. We're not going to jump around between them. We're just going to keep it as sum of squared regressors. But just to let you know, in other textbooks and other things you start looking online or other videos, sometimes you'll see this as the explained sum of squares or sum of squares explained. We're then going to have, that was SSR. Let's change colors for the next one here. We're then going to have SSE. Not the SSE we just introduced, sum of squared explained. That's really the sum of squared regressors. In this case, this is the sum of squared errors. Sum of squared errors. And really what this is, is just the summation of our errors. So again, remember how we get our errors. That's y minus y hat squared. Uh, similarly, we defined y minus y hat as just e. So this is just the summation of all of our errors squared. That's the sum of squared errors. So we'd figure out the difference in every actual value of y from our data set versus the predicted value of y. That's the corresponding error term or residual. We take the square of all of those errors, and that's our sum of squared errors. Kind of threw in that other term there, residual, right? It's the residual value between the actual y and the estimated value of y. This is where we get into another point of confusion sometimes because other books, other videos will sometimes refer to this guy as sum of squared residuals. That is because that error term is the residual difference between actual y and predicted y. It is a residual value. So we're taking the sum of the squared residuals. So that is just to clarify again. Sometimes you will see this guy referred to as SSE, sum of squared explained. And sometimes you'll see this guy being referred to as sum of squared residuals. That is the way that they're breaking up is completely reversed. Confusing depending on where you are. That's why you need to really get into the definitions as to what is being referred to. But as I said, we will keep it rather simple and straightforward. We will maintain consistency and we will say SSR is sum of squared regressors and SSE is sum of squared errors. And then finally, what we have 
So the sum of squared regressors, sum of squared errors, the final term, of course, is going to be our sum of square total. So again, sum of square total. Oh, oh, those didn't really work out too well, but total. And in this case here, what we have is the summation of our value of y minus our average value of y, and then all squared, right? Sum of squared total. Uh, the way that we can think about this, if we really want right, to give it some context, because as it is, we just kind of have these equations, like, okay, what's going on? Well, let's start off by taking a look at this sum of squared total. Essentially, what we have here is the numerator if we were trying to find the variance of our y variable, right? If we wanted to find the variance, we would just go over n minus 1, and then there we go. That would be s squared of y. But we're not trying to find the variance of y. We're trying to find the sum of squares, just the numerator aspect. So really what this sum of squares total is saying is just the total volatility in our y variable. So we have our total volatility in y altogether. Then what we have is our sum of squared errors. This is the volatility of y, which is not explained by our model. So there's total volatility of y, total volatility of y. This is the volatility that's not explained by our model, meaning this one, the SSR, sum of squared regressors, this is the volatility in y, which is explained by our model, explained through the impact of x on y. So when we go through and we get that r squared is equal to sum of squared regressors all over sum of squared total, what this is really saying is this is the total variability in y. This is the variability in y that is explained by our model. So again, the bigger we have is our r squared, the more of this total volatility we can explain with our model with the variability of x. So that's really what we're measuring as we go through this. Another way to take a look at it would be kind of uh, the visual representation of the model itself. So here we have our OLS line of best fit, the kind of blue teal line here. We then have the actual observation of y. We have our estimate of y hat. So that distance there, that is, of course, our error term. And if we were to take all of those error terms, that is our sum of squared errors. If we were to take a look at the difference between y bar and y, well, sum of y minus y bar squared, that's that whole part where that's getting towards our variance. So this whole bit here is the entire variation of y, the difference between the y we've witnessed and our average y. So that's our total variation, sum of squares total. The leftover bit, the part that's explained by our model itself, so this is the total variation that we have for this view of y. This is the aspect that is unexplained just due to an error. So this leftover bit between our regression line and the value of y bar itself, y hat minus y bar, this is our sum of squared regressors. That is, this is our explained volatility. That is our explained volatility. Ultimately, r squared is simply one tool in determining how well a model fits the data. Like any tool, it's ultimately imperfect. High values of r squared become it kind of become questionable. Low values of R squared similarly become kind of questionable. Uh, so anytime it's too high, anytime it's kind of low, we kind of have to be like, hmm, what's going on here? Uh, similarly, say you have two different models that you're trying to determine which one is best for utilization. Comparing R squared isn't really a method to determine the best model. That is really all this is, is it's a good tool to say, hey, out of the total variation in y, how much of it is being explained by our model. Just gives us some insight into what's happening, but it's not an end-all, be-all measure of measure uh, level of measurement. It's just a insight as to what's happening. So we do have to be a little bit careful of that. 
Uh, let's jump forward though. Let's take a look at an example of calculating R squared, calculating and determining our goodness of fit. So here we have a bunch of information for our ordinary least squares model. Uh, we have in this here, we have our correlation, our value of X bar, our value of Y bar. We have our standard deviation of X, we have our standard deviation of Y. That is just with all this above information here, I could ask you to solve for B1, our slope coefficient, and B0, our vertical intercept. Fortunately, I've done it for you already. I've just put that there as a, hey, that's what our regression model works out to be. I also have here what are some of our standard deviation, rather, of our errors are. So that's not our sum of squared errors. It's just the standard deviation of the errors. And then we have here our sum of squared regressors and our sum of squared errors. We want to compute and interpret the goodness of fit of this model. In order to do this, wait a minute, wait a minute here, we have that r squared equals the explained part of the model, sum of squared regressors, all over the total variations, sum of squared total. Seems like we have a bit of a problem here. Seems like we have a bit of a problem. We have sum of squared regressors. Okay, that's great. But we then have just sum of squared errors, the unexplained part of the model. Uh-oh, we are missing, we are missing our sum of square total. Uh, this seems problematic. Worry not, let's just jump back a page and take a look. What we can see in this diagram here is that the sum of square totals from here all the way up to here, hey, that was just the sum of squared regressors plus the sum of squared errors. So, hey, we can take advantage of that fact. We can take advantage of the fact that the sum of squares total, the total volatility in Y, is equal to the sum of squared regressors, the explained variability in Y, plus the sum of squared errors, the unexplained variability in Y. So, hey, we can do that. Uh, sum of squared regressors is 150. Sum of squared errors is 250. So what do we get all together? We get a sum of squares total equal to uh, 400. So total volatility in Y is 400. That's the sum of squares total. And then we can now compute our R squared. Squared is just going to be our sum of squared regressors. So our explained variability, that's 150 all over our total volatility, that's 400. We get all together a measurement of R squared of 0 0.375. That is to kind of interpret what that means is out of all of the changes in Y, 37.5% of these changes are being explained by changes in X. So all of that different movement of X, movement of X, it only explains about 37.5% of the movement in Y. So that's one of the ways we can interpret this. Uh, in terms of goodness of fit, it's on the lower side. It's not super low. It's not super high. But uh, it doesn't. it's kind of giving us this insight that there is a lot of movement in Y. A lot of Y is not being explained by our model. Majority of Y is being explained by, majority of this movement around of Y is being explained by unknown errors, right? There's something else happening altogether that is not our variable of interest that is explaining the majority of this variability. So that's something that we'd have to think about is be like, hmm, maybe X isn't a good thing to describe Y. Maybe there's something else better out there to explain what's happening here. So we've gone through this whole part. We've taken a look at correlation. We've calculated correlation. We've tested whether or not correlation is significant or not. We've then gone and we've introduced our OLS regression model. We've gone through our assumptions of our OLS regression model, and we figured out how to calculate our values of B0, our values of B1. 
what we're going to go on to next is ultimately what we're going to get to is say, hey, here's B0, here's B1. Let's test whether or not these guys are significant. That is, go through our five-step hypothesis testing procedure and determine, are these values different than zero? Are they greater than zero? Are they less than zero? Depending on the hypothesis test we want to conduct. And we're not going to go through all the math in actually calculating this because, well, it's not crazy exhaustive at this point in the semester, it's going to be exhaustive in, enough. That what we're going to do is just rely on kind of, uh, I don't know if it's the right word to use, but we're going to cheat. We're just going to utilize some regression output from a stats program, and we're going to interpret and read this regression output in order to conduct the hypothesis test. So that is, we're not going to have to calculate everything like we normally would in step five. We're going to have it all calculated for us. We're just going to need to read and interpret it properly. So let's jump over and let's take a look at an example of regression output. Different stats programs have different output types, but all the information is usually there one place or another. In this case, we have output from Excel. So if you were to run a regression in Excel, you would get a situation like this. That is what we have is we have our starting up at the top with those regression statistics. Let's go use a color that you'll be able to see. Uh, to start off, what do we have? First thing we want to take a look at is probably this term here of R squared. Now, keep in mind, we also have multiple R and adjusted R square. Uh, adjusted R square is a case if we have multiple linear regression, that is several values of X entering in. In our case, we don't, so we can ignore that guy. Multiple R, similarly, this is not of relevance to us at this point, so we could ignore that. Uh, as we go through, what is of interest? Well, the R square, of course. So that there, uh, that is our value of R squared meaning this is the percent of variation of y that's explained by x. So in this case, what do we have? About 41% of the variation of y is being explained by the variation of x. So, okay, that's, uh, that's not so bad. I don't know if it's necessarily great, but it's not so bad. Uh, what do we have as the next one that we can take a look at? We have our standard error. Uh, if we were interested, this standard error this is the standard deviation of our error terms. So if we were to take a look at all of the errors, the difference between y and y hat, that would be the standard deviation of all of our error terms. Uh, keep in mind, right, as we talked about, SSE is just the summation of all of our error terms squared. So, hey, if that's the standard deviation of our errors, we could say that the variance of our errors is the summation of all of our errors squared all over n. We could work backwards from that guy, recognizing that that is our standard deviation of our errors. That is the square root of summation of e squared all over n. Well, we could work backwards from that number to the variance. And then once we have the variance, we could work out based off of our sample size. And we could work out then back once again to solve for our sum of squared errors. Now, okay, in order to do that, we would need to know what is our sample size. Well, hey, that's our next point here. Number of observations, that's our sample size. In this case, we're running a regression based off of 10, 10 observations. So we would have an N of 10 in this scenario. As we continue down this list and look underneath the part where it says ANOVA, well, underneath ANOVA, we have regression, we have residual, and we have total. What is, uh, what is all these parts here? So we have the SS attached to each of these, right? What, what are these values? What are these values? Well, these values are telling us this guy here is our SSR, the sum of squares for the regression. 
The next one, residual, now, right, is where we need to be careful. Residual errors, those are usually used interchangeably. So when it says residuals, this is our sum of squared errors. So yeah, we could do this, but it's kind of a jerk thing to actually go through the process of doing because, hey, it's given to us right there in the output. Finally, total, well, hopefully you've caught on as to what's happening here. This would be our sum of squares total, meaning we should be able to utilize this information here and get the same result as our R squared up above. That is, if we took that 2690, and we'll just carry a few decimal places, 785, and we divide that by total, so 6500 uh, to 44, what do we get? We get, sure enough, within some little bit of rounding error, we get our value of r squared. So, hey, we can calculate r squared if we didn't have, if we didn't have this top part, we could still calculate r squared just based off of the information given in this part of our table. So, some useful bits going on there. Okay, the next bit down, what we have is a whole bunch of situation happening in this table. What, uh, what does it all mean? Well, first bit, coefficients. Well, these are our coefficients for B0 or B1, or if you were running a multiple in your regression, you would have B2, B3, B4, on and on and on and on. Uh, and each of them is being told for what it is. So that's for our intercept, that's for our first X, and if we had multiple Xs, that could be X1 x2, x3, on and on and on. But of course, we don't have that. We just have the one value of x. So we would have b0, b1. That's the corresponding coefficient. So hey, just from that, we could write our regression equation as y equals b0. So b0 is 50.00. Uh, yeah, you know what? We're just going to go 50. 50 plus our slope coefficient, that is the coefficient on our x variable, that's 0 0.5057, and then x. So hey, just from that, we've been able to pull out our regression line. Great. Carrying on down the table, what do we have next? These are our standard errors. That is the standard error for b0. This is the standard error for b1. That is if we think about back when we had our distributions, let's just take a quick aside here, quick aside to something we're familiar with. Here's our distribution of x bar, normally distributed, centered around mu, and x bar had the standard error of x bar, which was equal to standard deviation of x all over root n. Or in the case where we had a sample, we expressed it as the standard error of x bar, which was equal to the sample standard deviation of x all over root n. That is, this guy, standard error of beta naught, standard error of beta 1, is giving us similarly, hey, our distribution of beta naught, beta 1, which is going to be t distributed, will have these values for their corresponding standard error. Meaning we could go and do something like this. Let's just get rid of that, get rid of that, get rid of that. We could go, okay, hey, here is our distribution of B0. We'll presume underneath our null, we're centered around zero. And we're gonna have a standard error of B0 equal to, what do we have there? 2892. So there we go. 2892 is the standard error of B0. Well, hey, we could then go do a hypothesis test. That is, we would have to standardize it. Our beta, sorry, not beta, B values will go down to a T, and then we can work it out correspondingly. Luckily for you, you don't have to go through the process of calculating all this. And why don't you have to go through the process of calculating all that? Because the next thing in our table here is our t statistic. That is our test stat that you would have calculated in step five. That is essentially these t stats are computed as your 
coefficient, right? T would be beta naught minus our assumption of, sorry, beta naught all over the standard errors of beta naught. Instead of you having to go through and calculating what that test statistic would be, ah, it does it for you. There's your test statistic for beta naught. There's your test statistic for beta one. Step five, done, already given to you in this equation. Great, wow, that's easy. But hey, I'll give you one better even. The one better even, let's just make a little bit more room so I can write. The one better is the next one down right here. These are our p-values. That is the p-value, the probability that we've witnessed the test statistic that we have or more extreme. Meaning, here we go, for beta naught, we have a p-value of 0.12. For beta one, we have a p-value of 0.044. So, okay, just a quick reminder, how do we interpret, how do we use those p-values? Well, our typical decision rule is if the p-value is less than our significance level, we reject the null. So typically, like nine times out of 10, the null that we're testing is, is beta not equal to zero? versus is beta not not equal to zero, right? Because we wanna know, hey, is our vertical intercept actually a significant value or is it essentially just passing through the origin? Similarly, I'll just scroll down a little bit. Our typical question would be beta one equal to zero versus beta one not equal to zero. So typically, these are the hypothesis tests that we conduct. And if we have our decision rules stated around p-values, well, all we have to do is say, okay, there is our null and alternative. Let's state what we're testing at. Let's say we're testing at a 5% level. Well, okay, if I'm, if I'm testing at a 5% level, I can jump over step three because I don't need to worry about my t-stat. I can jump to step four. I can state my decision rule. So, okay, here I have alpha 5%. So I'll just say, if my p-value is less than 5%, I will reject the null. Okay, so great, that's stated. Now that that's stated, let's just go to step five. We don't have to calculate anything we can just go and take a look at what's going on up there with our p-values and determine what's going on. So let's determine what's going on. Uh, let's start off with b naught. So with b naught, what's our result? What do we decide? Well, with b naught, we have a p-value of 12%. Well, hey, 12% is not less than 5%. So for B naught, we would fail to reject. What does that mean? What does that mean? If we fail to reject, it means kind of scratch out your alternative there. It means we have no evidence to say that beta naught is anything but zero. We don't have enough evidence to say that it's anything but. So essentially we believe that value of beta naught is zero. What about for B1? Well, for B1, what do we have going on? Well, we have a p-value of 0 0.044. So, okay, 0 0.044 is less than 0 0.05. That is 4% is less than 5%. So is 4% is less than 5%. We will take that as evidence to reject the null. Again, if we reject the null, what does that tell us? reject the null, get rid of that guy there. What this is telling us is that we have evidence to suggest that the true population slope coefficient is different than zero. We could then go and test farther and say, well, hey, is it positive, is it negative? Well, in this case here, because this guy here is positive, 
we can be pretty positive that pretty positive, pretty sure that our slope coefficient is actually a positive slope coefficient, meaning there is a positive relationship between x and y. That is, as x goes up, y goes up. And then based off of our estimate, at least, let's just go down here. We have a value of b1 equal to 0. Point, oh, I lost it. What was it? Value of b1 equal to 0. Point five zero uh five zero we'll go five zero five seven five zero five seven so the way that we can interpret that is that every time x goes plus one right x gets bigger by one unit well then y at least in this sample scenario is going to get bigger by that slope amount. So by 0 0.5057. And we have our relationship here in that case, at least our estimated relationship between X and Y. Okay, so that's how we can interpret this uh, statistical output, this regression output for some X and Y. Uh, as we go through this, sometimes, depending on your stat software, you will get this extra information just provided to you. Sometimes you have to go digging deeper to find it. In Excel, it typically provides it as just an extra click. And that extra information that we can take a look at is things like our residuals. So taking a look here, we have our values of predicted Y. What's, what's that? These are our values of Y hat. That is, you wouldn't have to go through and calculate them all. They're just saying, hey, for each x that we have an actual value for, this is what the corresponding value of y hat would be. Because we've gone and calculated those values of y hat for every existing value of x, every existing value of x would have had a paired y. So that is, we could also get each of our residuals or what we have been referring to as errors. So in this here, we get for our 10 observations, we get each value of y hat, and we get each corresponding residual. What we could look at as well is the plot of our residuals. So there's our residual plot. Again, what are we looking for in our residual plot? Well, going back to our assumptions for OLS, when we take a look at this residual plot, it should look random and uncorrelated, which taking a look at it, is Essentially, it does. I don't see too much correlation happening here. I don't see any kind of direction that these dots are moving. And as I look through, I don't really see any changes in variability as we work through. I mean, if we take a look at it, generally speaking, the variability stays within that bounds. There is this one observation that kind of breaks this bit, but if it's just that one, generally our assumption holds. I'm pretty sure we're homoscedastic, or close enough to at least. We can then also take a look at our normal probability plot. All this tells us is if we were normal, we should have all of these dots along a straight line. The farther these dots deviate from some straight line, the farther from normality our errors are. In this case here, yeah, those errors look pretty close to some straight linear line. So because they look pretty close to a straight linear line, I can presume that my errors are normally distributed. So again, all that that does is allows me to do that hypothesis test for B1 and B0. So that's, that's the big takeaway with that. Again, these typically will not be provided to you. I typically won't be asking you anything about these. This is just for your information so that if you were ever to get into practicing and conducting an OLS regression, you can check your assumptions against these kind of extra bits of output. And again, as a quick reminder, those are the seven assumptions of our OLS model. Okay, what I want to take a look at next is a... I don't know if I want to say neat because many of you might roll your eyes and what I think is neat, but that kind of neat thing as to why we need to be critical of our OLS results and we need to be careful about how much faith we put into our results. 
And in order to take a look at this, what we're going to take a look at is ANSCOM's quartet. So what we're going to take a look at with ANSCOM's quartet is four different OLS models. And each of these models gets the exact same result. Each one builds a model such that Y hat equals three plus 0.5x. Farther to this, each of these models has the exact same standard error. So the standard error for B naught is 1.12, and the standard error for B1, our slope coefficient, is 0 0.11. So we get the same standard error, we get the same coefficients, same coefficients, same standard error means we'd have the same p-value attached to whether or not these guys are significant or not. We'll go one step farther. Each of these four models has the exact same value of r squared of 0 0.67. Again, how do we interpret that? That's saying that 67% of the variation in y is explained by variation in x. So okay, four models, all four models with the exact same results, meaning we often have to go a little bit farther than the data itself, a little bit farther than the output itself, sorry, and we need to actually take a look at the visual interpretation of the model and make a determination based off of that as to whether or not we've used the right tool, whether or not we've used the right model for the right job. So let's go take a look at these four different outputs. There we go. So we see in each case, we see our actual plotted values from the scatter dot. I'm just going over the one on the top left there with some red to highlight it. And we see in each case, we get the exact same regression line. That's the blue line. And then we get the same value of r squared and everything. We see that although that's the case, looking at the corresponding data, we get very, very different fits all together. So that is, although all of them gave us the same regression output, that gives us the same estimation of y hat, the same values of r squared, the same standard errors, the same p-values, they are all modeling the data in very, very different ways. So taking a look at this, right, this is the importance of data visualization and going, okay, cool, I've got my model. How does it look? You know, taking a look at it, I'd be like, well, that's, that's, not, that's not a terrible model. That one's not terrible. This one, well, taking a look at it, something's going on here such that maybe this isn't actually a linear relationship between X and Y, right? Taking a look at that, that looks actually more parabolic. Maybe this is a situation more of being like x, x squared or a parabolic, some kind of situation like that relationship between x and y. That is the models forcing it to fit linearly, but mm, we might want to rethink how we do this. In this case, yeah, this isn't bad, but it does bring to question what's going on here. What's going on with that data point? And is this really modeling things in a great way? Again, we'll have to make a judgment call. This case, ooh, we get all of our data points more or less in a line right here, and then this one doing its own thing, which is what skews the regression line to fit the same as the rest. So really the point of this, the point of taking a look at these four models is to say, we can't just rely on R squared, we can't just rely on the significance of our coefficients and say, hey, I ran my model. We've got a pretty good R squared. We've got significant coefficients. We're good. We're done. Let's walk away. We're happy with our model. No, 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 no. We've got to do a step farther. We have to take a look at the results themselves. We have to look at the visualization of it. And we need to say, are we happy with that? Do we actually feel that this model does a good job of explaining the data. And this is where we kind of get into the art side of things, right? There's a lot of science, there's a lot of just the rigor of math with this, but there's also the lot of subjectivity through our assumptions and through our looking at things like this and deciding, hmm, does this actually fit the data well? And that's, that's just looking at it and making that decision. And that could change from person to person. Okay.
That criticism aside, let's wrap up with a few more questions. These are questions that you might see on an exam, questions you might see on the quizzes. And these are about testing our values for B0, B1. That is whether or not we would take that as evidence as to whether or not beta0 or beta1 are significant. And then questions about R squared and the like as well. So let's take a look at two of those to finish off for this video. Okay, so here we have a regression model. What do we have here? So consider the following regression, modeling the effects of income on consumption in thousands of dollars. So, okay, we have our intercept and then we have our X variable. In this case here, our X variable is labeled as income. So it's the effect of income on consumption. Kind of what we looked at earlier on in this class where we said consumption is a function of income. What do we have as our function of income? Well, we have an intercept of 16.042. Just have to cut off the decimals somewhere. So let's pick three decimal places. Plus our slope coefficient, that's 0 0.904. Why not use four or sorry, three decimal places? And then that's times our level of income, our x variable all together. Okay, so there's our regression output. That's our regression equation in case we needed to refer to it. What are we doing? Well, question one, test at the 5% level if the coefficients of this model are significantly different than zero. So, okay, step one, hypothesis test, state our hypothesis. So what do we have in this case? Whether or not they are significantly different than zero. So what we're saying is, uh, sorry, we're using our population parameters, B0, B1. We're saying, are they different than zero? So that is, we're not saying, do we think they're positive? We're not saying, do we think they're negative? Just are they different than zero versus our null case, which would be B0, B1 equals zero. So, okay, we're just conducting both hypothesis tests concurrently, so we're just stating them concurrently here. Step two, what's our significance level? Well, our significance level in this case here is 5%. Step three, well, we can actually cheat a little bit. We can jump over step three if we wanted to because we have the p-values given to us. If we didn't want to jump over step three, well, you could go, okay, we have a t, uh, n minus k minus one, and you're gonna be confused by that because we haven't introduced this, but it would be your beta value, sorry, your b value minus your beta value all over your standard deviation of b. But for our purposes, we can essentially ignore this because we're not gonna, I'm not gonna have you do this. I'm just gonna have you interpret it straight from the table. So step four, what can we say in step four? We can say if that p value is less than our significance level of 0 0.05, we will take that as evidence to reject the null. Okay, step five, actually make our decision. So let's just scroll down a little bit so I have some room. What do we have? We have B0, we have B1, and what do we have for our corresponding p-values? So for our intercept, that's B0, we have a p-value of 28%. Ooh, 0 0.28 less than 0 0.05. Well, no, I don't think so. Not the case. So what does that mean? That means we fail to reject. Uh, fail to reject? No, let's fix that. Fail to reject. Again, if we're failing to reject, how do we do? We can just go back up just a little bit here. And we can say for B naught, if we fail to reject, we're saying, hey, this alternative, we have no evidence to support the alternative, meaning that we have no evidence to say that it's anything but zero. So in this case, we'd believe that our intercept to actually be zero. What about B1? Well, in B1, we have a p-value here of 0 0.0004. So essentially, we have a p-value here of zero. And we're saying, is that less than 0 
yeah, yeah, clearly that's less than 0 0.05. So therefore we would reject. We would reject the null. And if we reject the null for B1, what does that say? We're saying we have evidence against this. We have evidence against beta one being zero, meaning we believe that beta one is in fact not equal to zero. And in our case here, probably positive. There's probably a positive relationship between income and consumption based off of these results. Okay, step two, or not step two, rather question two. What do we have going on in question two? What percentage of the variation of y is explained by x? Well, this is just really what we were getting at with our value for r squared. How much variation in y is explained by x? And all we need to do for that is just pull out this value here, our r squared, not the multiple r, not the adjusted r squared, but just the r squared. And altogether, it's about 50.33%. Uh, let me take a look, 0 0.50338, sorry, we need them around properly. So that wouldn't be 0.33, that'd be 50.34%, right? That eight would round the three up to three, four. So about 50, just over 50% of the variation in Y is being explained by variation in X. Finally, third question that we have on this slide, what is the predicted level of consumption when income is $55,000? Well, everything is being presented in thousands, so we can just use 55. So essentially what we're doing is we're just going back to this model that we wrote out to start, and we're just putting in a value for income of 55. So if we go and do that, Consumption equals 16.042 plus 0 0.904 times 55. What do we get? Well, we can work that out. We get an estimated value of consumption equal to, right? And we should be clear here. This is our predicted value of consumption. So consumption hat, and that works out to be 60. Five, seven, six, two. So in this case here, given this modeling process, we would actually say, hey, if you had income of $55,000, you're actually gonna consume just over $65,000. Meaning if we were to interpret that from an economic viewpoint, you're borrowing money, you're dissaving, right? You are spending more money on consumption than you're making. And the only way you can do that is by borrowing. So we get our estimated, we get our predicted level of consumption. Okay, so these are the kind of questions we'll see. Let's go do one more quick one, and then we'll wrap up for this video as it's gone on for quite a while already. So similar situation here. We have a few extra, a few different questions thrown in, but same kind of idea. First one. We want to test at the 1% level if the coefficients of this model are significantly different than zero. So, okay, testing at the 1% level. Again, what we're really testing, H0, H1. We're testing in each case. All we're saying is different than zero. We're not saying greater than. We're not saying less than. So we're just saying underneath our null, we believe that they're equal to zero. Underneath the alternative, we are saying maybe they're not equal to zero. Step two, this time we're doing it at the 1% level. Step three, we can skip step three because we have the p-values given to us. Step four, we'll say if our p-value is less than our significance level, 0 0.01, we will reject. And so what do we get? We have B0, we have B1. What do we have for our p-values in each case? Well, for B0, we have a p-value of 0 0.026. For B1, we have a p-value of 0 0.002. So, okay, in each case, compare that to our significance level of 0 0.01. 0 0.01. In this case here, we have the following. 
that is not less than, we would fail to reject. Where for B1, it is less than, so we would reject. Of note, and I know I've stressed this several times throughout the course, this is the importance of being explicit and stating your significance level before you go take a look at the p-values because this fail to reject scenario is entirely dependent on our choice of alpha. For example, had we chosen an alpha of 5%, a 5% significance level to start us off, well, we would have had a very different scenario. That is, we would have had 0 0.026 would be less than 0 0.05 which would have led to a reject scenario. So we really need to be sure that we're setting our significant levels early based off of our perceived significance, based off of our weighing of type one and type two errors. And then as we go through, we're testing that. That's not gonna be super relevant for us because I'll always give you the significance level, just trying to instill some best practices for the few of you who will go on into actually practicing this. Okay. Question two, what do we have for question two? Again, we're saying what percentage of the variation of y is explained by x? Again, what I'm getting at is our value of r squared. r squared, our coefficient of determination, what variability of y is explained by variability of x? And in this case, we get what? Just over 66.67%. So two thirds of the variation of x sorry, two thirds of the variation of y is being explained by x. Step three. Okay, what are we doing here in step three? Well, in step three, we have, let's just scroll down a little bit. What is the pred predicted value of y when x equals eight? So we need to build our regression model. We have y equals our intercept value. Our intercept value is a coefficient of three plus our slope coefficient, 0.5x. Okay, what is the value of y when x equals eight? So we throw eight in for x and we get that y hat equals three plus 0.5 eight, I don't even need a calculator for that. We have 0.5 times eight is four, three plus four is seven, we get y hat equal to seven. Great, that's not so bad, that's easy. This video went on quite a bit longer than I had intended, but hopefully through this we've had quite the exhaustive conversation we have all together gone through and started off taking a look at correlation. That is the relationship between X and Y, and we've seen how to calculate our sample correlation. That is the covariance between X and Y, and then times the ratio between standard deviation Y, standard deviation of X. From there, we went on and we saw how to test this, and we saw that we could test this using our five-step hypothesis testing procedure, such that the only real introduction, the only real new thing that we've introduced is in our step three, such that in our step three, we had the test statistic of t n minus two equal to r times the square root of our degrees of freedom, n minus two, all over one minus r squared where again, when I say R in this case, I'm talking about our computed sample correlation. So that's how we started off. From there, we had a little bit of caution of correlation does not mean causation, and we looked uh, briefly at spurious correlations. From there, we moved on into regression, and specifically simple OLS regression, ordinary least squares. We went and took a look at our seven assumptions. These seven assumptions are just to make you aware of them. They're not really at this level going to be a big play in it. For the most part, we'll wave our hands and pretend that these assumptions are met. 
But in that assumption, we then went and figured out how we could calculate B0 and B1. From calculating B0 and B1, we went and we introduced this idea of goodness of fit, R squared. R squared included the following terms, our sum of squares total, which was equal to our sum of squared regressors plus our sum of squared errors, such that R squared was the ratio between our explained errors over our total errors. That is the variation of Y that's explained over the variation of Y total. We then finished off with some interpretation, some interpretation of regression output. And through this interpretation of regression output, we were able to conduct hypothesis tests, hypothesis tests, and we conducted those for beta naught and beta one. And we were able to kind of cheat a little bit because we were able to jump over step three, which was the test statistic. We were able to not have to calculate in step five. We were able just to utilize through step four, stating our decision rule, and then looking up the p-value and deciding from that. Hope that video was exhaustive. Hope that video went through all of those aspects for you. Of course, should you have any questions on anything we've covered, if anything is not entirely clear, please feel free to send me an email. Please feel free to post on the frequently asked questions or make a comment below. Thanks. Till next time.